So in terms of introduction, uh, it is with great pleasure that I welcome everyone to this joint event between the Young Urbanists and the NIC Young Professional Panel. We have a great lineup of speakers. Uh, back in April, the Young Urbanist Steering Committee proposed several themes for 2021 to 2022. Leveling up was top of the list. Uh, as a Young Urbanist, I expressed inter interest in uh, deliver an event and level up with a focus on infrastructure combined with the urban renewal agenda. At the end of 2020, uh, I also read a fascinating article in the AOU journal on levelling up health inequalities by Monica Lauricus in response to the publication of the National Infrastructure Strategy where reference to health is made over 20 times. I will now pass over to Monica who will introduce you to the NIC YPP. Thanks very much, Kevin, and uh, thanks for the, to the Academy of Urbanism for joining forces with the National Infrastructure and its uh, Young Professionals Panel. So I'm, I'm Monica Laukas, and I am a consultant, a senior consultant at, at ACOM, but I'm also a member of the NIC YPP, which is a multidisciplinary group of 10 young, young professionals working across the infrastructure sector in in roles including uh, engineers, economists, and consultants. Yeah. Um, we are passionate about uh, supporting the NIC's uh, decision-making process and ensuring that uh, younger audiences truly have the opportunity to help shaping the future of the UK's infrastructure. So in doing so, we, we have uh, set up a podcast, uh, Infra Unstructured, which you can find on iTunes and Spotify. We also have a YouTube channel with short informational videos on things like uh, leveling up. And you can also find us on Instagram and LinkedIn at the NICYPP. It's a pleasure to be part of this event, which features uh, such a great lineup of speakers and really covers a topic that is, uh, is close to my passion. So um, Kevin, back to you in terms of uh, introducing what we will be discussing today. Thanks, Monica. Uh, before jumping into the presentations, I'll probably set the scene on what levelling up is. It is the general question everyone asks. And uh, I do think that the NIC have done a great job in terms of presenting this visually. Uh, there is actually uh, on their podcast uh, a great uh, short clip uh, that demonstrates the uh, differences in productivity uh, between regions within the UK predominantly differences in productivity uh, experience between London and the South East and the North with uh, Manchester, Liverpool and Leeds shown on, on the graph uh, above. Uh, and this is unique uh, in the sense that uh, regional disparities are not as clear cut as they are in the UK, uh, as, as you can see in Germany, Italy and also in the Netherlands. Uh, that it is more sort of equal in terms of productivity. And as I said, it, if you follow the link below, uh, there's a really good uh, video that explains this. As I said, I could be here all, I could be here all evening answering the question of what is leveling up. And we already have an ambitious program of speakers. Uh, the, the work of the NIC YPP is a, a good starting point, as I said, uh, and I'll skip to the next slide. In terms of trying to summarise uh, levelling up, uh, I think you do need to take a local place-based approach to it. Uh, the problem is it's it's long-standing and it's complex. Uh, it's not simply a north-south divide. Underperformance in coastal areas and remote rural areas is also the case. There are also forgotten places as well. Uh, London also suffers from it, extreme inequalities. So levelling up will not address everything. Uh, there's a need to consider a suite of socio-economic factors, so physical and mental health, access to local services, uh, and local place-based and people-focused solutions are key. I'm quite keen that we promote bottom-up initiatives. Uh, they're required, and also we need to look at changing the urban form as well. Uh, so, yeah, the, the title of this uh, event is Transformative Infrastructure and its role in levelling up. Uh, the Level Up White Paper was anticipated to be out this autumn. Uh, it, it, it's now scheduled for mid-December. It will set the general focus and themes. 
uh, and there's, there's, there's identified as being five themes, local leadership, growth, people, pride in place and infrastructure. Uh, this uh, event focuses on infrastructure and I think there's, there's two key themes to pick up on and that's incremental changes and transformative changes. And there's a photograph of uh, Utrecht Central Railway Station uh, in the Netherlands where an example of uh, transformation brought about by infrastructure. So uh, moving ahead, uh, in terms of the, the running order, uh, the event, as I said, will focus on people and places. The presentation emphasizes the importance of infrastructure interventions and leveling up at various spatial scales. Therefore, we start the presentations off with leveling up in health at the human scale with Monica. We will then build up the spatial and geographical scale, moving to the role of actual tr active travel in the rural from Carlos Soto from Sustrans. Then it is great to have Ben uh, from the NIC reporting back on the NIC Towns Infrastructure and Re Regeneration Study with reference to Stevenage Town Centre in Grimsby. Uh, it is also great to have Amanda Stone, rail lead at WSP, on board, who will discuss the importance of connectivity and improving trans Pennine links at the regional scale. And last but not least, Nicholas Falk will take us on a grand tour and provide us with examples from outside the UK on how cities elsewhere in Europe fund and deliver better local trans transit systems from the up uplift in land values. So without further ado, over to you, Monica. Thanks, Kevin. I'll just share my screen. Um, great. And uh, yeah, as you mentioned, I'll, um, I'll give a quick overview on how health and infrastructure are related and why leveling up should be used as an opportunity to address health inequalities in the country. So the, your introduction, Kevin, gave, it, gave a great uh, overview of this, but uh, the UK is the most geographically unequal developed uh, economy in the world, with the Southeast being among uh, the most productive and prosperous places in Europe, while most of those in the North and Midlands uh, uh, lag behind. And uh, of course, it's not uh, as easy as a North-South divide, but the um, uh, index of multiple deprivation shows it uh, very well, uh, including um, social, environmental, and economic factors, um, we, which uh, basically um, give you, it, it gives you an overview of uh, where the, the most deprived areas are, um, which are in the Northwest and the Northeast. Um, but the inequality are reflected in, uh, in health outcomes as well. And especially this is true for gap in life expectancy of birth. The more deprived the area, the shorter the life expectancy is, uh, with the gap between the least and most deprived areas in the UK being uh, nearly 11 years for males and uh, over eight for females, which is massive and it continues to grow year on year. And this is just not a, an issue in terms of, uh, of health outcomes, but it is also reflected in economic productivity and the need for leveling up. Um, the, these health divides uh, were highlighted also in the in the Marmot review into health inequalities in England, which was published in 2010. And the review um, does a great job in showing the that health inequalities are linked to wider socioeconomic factors, including uh, the conditions in which uh, people are born, grow, live, work, and age. And Based on historical data, the Marmot review argues that economic growth without uh, a reduction in inequality will not result in better health. It is uh, also argued that improving health result, will result in economic benefits to a certain extent. So this is um, it's very key to this link between leveling up and, uh, and uh, addressing health inequalities, especially given that with COVID uh, and the inequalities have not reduced, but actually have widened and the the pandemic has exacerbated the, the, the this divide. In addition, the, the review uh, makes a case for a multidisciplinary approach to, to achieve a reduction in health inequalities, which integrates uh, health policies with housing, economic development, and transport policies. And this is where infrastructure comes to play. 
it's the, the National Infrastructure Strategy, which was published uh, uh, in November last year, points out that uh, as well as being vital for the economy and productivity growth, uh, infrastructure is also a key driver of public health outcomes. The benefit and negative impacts of infrastructure are not equally distributed uh, across the society, which means that the uh, deprived areas uh, and some parts of the population are usually disproportionately affected by infrastructure schemes or investments. For example, the, the people who live closest to motorways and are affected by long-term exposure to air pollution are usually the most deprived. And on the slide, you can see that I have included an image of a fake sign that was introduced in, uh, in London. Uh, this spring, which highlights how air pollution is disproportionately impacting people of color and deprived communities. There are also positive connotations with uh, living within walkable neighborhoods, uh, with great access to public transport and open spaces, which leads to, to more uh, leisure time walking for adults. But on the contrary, uh, people living in less walkable neighborhoods uh, suffer of uh, overweight and obesity. And this is not just transport infrastructure. Flooding tends to affect the most deprived areas. And similarly, fuel poverty affects the most vulnerable in society. It is therefore um, very important that infrastructure planning and investment reflects on these spatial inequalities, uh, which are not just socioeconomics, but include the health and quality of life issues. And, the, and also future investment should consider ways to improve quality of life and placemaking that just that go beyond the, the pure physical infrastructure as the Marmot Review um, suggests. One step that the, the government has taken recently was with the updates to the Green Book. Um, in July, there was an, the introduction of a new guidance on well-being, which um, allows to quantify and monetize uh, well-being impacts uh, in terms of business cases and uh, policy evaluation. And this is a great step forward into uh, taking account of for harder to monetize impacts uh, such as health improvements, uh, which hopefully will be reflected in, uh, in schemes that will be uh, awarded funding in the leveling up fund for the second round. But just to conclude, I, I want to, to reiterate uh, that tackling health inequalities has to be integral in the leveling up agenda and in the long-term infrastructure planning. As we've seen so far, um, economic and social conditions have a profound uh, impact on health throughout people's lives. But the relationship is not just one way. Health is an essential input to economic prosperity for individuals, communities, and places. And as we seek to build back better and uh, level up the UK, there is now an opportunity to create more inclusive economies that are geared towards uh, reducing inequalities and improving health. And also, um, leveling up I don't, should not just be focused on places, but also on, on people and communities and the challenges that they are facing. And uh, yeah, so that, uh, that was all from me. That's great. Thank you, Monica. Uh, moving swiftly on to Carlos. All right. Um, hello. Uh, let me see if you see my screen. We can. All right. So good evening. Um, my name is Carlos Soto. I'm an urban planner and designer, and I'm currently working with Sustrans, specifically in Dumfries and Galloway. But today I just come as a member of the Young Urbanist Network of the Academy to talk to you about active transportation and leveling up. I will try to take you briefly uh, through a little bit of a context awareness about urban and rural systems and 
practical benefits of active travel and the challenges that we have to deliver this kind of infrastructure. So urban and rural areas across Scotland are defined by a classification based on population and accessibility based on a drive time analysis to differentiate between accessible and remote areas. The combination of these two variables results in settlement categories, as you can see on the right side. And here you can see like an eightfold and twofold map where it looks like pretty rural, right? So it is estimated that one fifth of the population in Scotland lives in rural areas. And this has, this has grown at a faster rate than in the rest of the country with more people moving into rural areas and moving from rural to urban areas. The relevance of this, um, the relevance of this uh, classification is that it has a close connection with the topic we are discussing today. As Kevin said before, uh, the need to level up varies between and within regions, and these inequalities sometimes are not that obvious within specific environments. So inequalities are not exclusive of a particular context, either rural or urban, both contexts in the UK are currently experiencing some form of inequality. If we take Glasgow as an example in the central belt, where inequalities can be spatially perceived, um, there is like a match between certain physical features that go hand in hand with those intangible characteristics of inequalities. And this results in quite defined pockets for intervention. Whereas in more rural areas, these inequalities might be hidden in an environment that looks homogeneous or where existing data doesn't allow us to draw conclusions on, on trying to find smaller pockets of deprivation. Um, also, there is evidence to say that people living in rural areas experience inequalities and deprivation in different ways that deserve attention. For example, not everyone uh, living in deprived areas is income deprived. And that is probably one of the main differences that could be mentioned. Along with this, there are other main issues that affect smaller towns and rural areas, like a higher living cost, less job opportunities and affordable housing, out migration of young people, income deprived people are more dispersed in rural areas and there is less access to key services. And this access, this lack of access might be associated with either a low offer of facilities or because people need to take longer units uh, to, to get to those available. That being said, active travel or transportation is one of the most critical aspects to tackle because in both urban and rural systems, it is transport what will provide access to the available services and facilities. And within the strategic realm of transport and non-motorized transportation, also known as active travel in combination with micromobility systems could offer what is probably the most local scale to work in and the closest to personal and behavioral aspects. Also taking into account that transport infrastructure interacts directly with at least four of the protected characteristics of the Equality Act. So how can active travel support leveling up? Well, there are many benefits, but <clears throat> just to highlight some of them in health and social justice, uh, as we saw before, accessing key facilities, including health services is compromised in some locations. So this is where the active component of transportation could help in meeting the recommended weekly physical activity, which will result in health benefits. Evidence suggests that active travel reduces the risk of cardiovascular and metabolic diseases by around 30%, as well as other conditions such as skeletal health and some types of cancer. Active travel offers a platform for interaction and participation in local planning, and this has some implications in building mental health via sense of belonging and stewardship of projects across a diverse branch of groups, including vulnerable people. In terms of living cost, active and partially active means of transportation can offer more affordable alternatives to car ownership. And extending this means of transportation to commercial premises has the potential to lower the cost of some local services, for example, delivery via cargo bikes. Um, in terms of local competitiveness, there are, of course, other benefits like an appropriate streetscape, a streetscape leads to better experiences for visitors and residents, and that translates into like um, 
more attractiveness in our high streets and an increase in footfall and trade. And also, for example, uh, for areas within rural settlements, recreational routes and active infrastructure could foster tourism and, and leisure economies. And this is something that is currently being considered in the south of Scotland, where the south of Scotland enterprise is working together with councils and other partners in order to come up with proposals to make the most of their assets and, and, and impulse this sector, which is very relevant in Scotland. Um, However, like delivering active travel infrastructure encounters some barriers and challenges from the planning and design stage. I compiled some findings to, from the literature, conversations with colleagues and, and my experiences to identify some of these and the top ranked were like number one, limited capacity of local authorities and high construction costs, lack of funding, spatial, um, constraints in the existing street network and many others, and some of them actually affect more rural areas than urban areas. Um, these challenges sometimes come together and not only make the projects um, progress slowly, but sometimes they simply prevent them to happen. And from this list, there are several um, constraints that could be sorted with uh, with assistance of the leveling of agenda by uh, offering platforms for capacity building, the allocation of funding and more favorable policies and criteria for the allocation of those funds. Also considering the investment in diversifying the offering areas where long distances are currently preventing people to benefit from scarce facilities. Um, as I said before, many of these um, affect more smaller towns and rural areas than urban settings. And I will finish with these um, final remarks. Multi-level system thinking is to be used in the analysis of inequalities, and this needs to be translated into policy development that should better, should better reflect on the diversity of scales and geographies, especially when these policies lead to design codes and guidelines that will, that will determine the delivery of infrastructure and other supporting schemes. Um, and let's uh, finish with this image, like inequalities cannot be tackled without equity. And let's imagine that in, uh, that bike that you see there is not a bike, but a funding opportunity, for example. If the funding opportunity is open for all, then that strives for equality. But if apart from the availability of the, of the funding itself, it offers considerations, incentives, and support, recognizing the diversity of realities and the challenges they pose, then that is a striving for equity. So even though the lack of funding is highly relevant and one of the main constraints to deliver infrastructure, the intersectionality with other challenges needs to be properly addressed. Um, so that was it. Thank you very much. And there, there you have some references and my contact details. Thank you, Carlos. Uh... Certainly, when you think of deprivation, sometimes in Scotland, you do think predominantly of the central belt, uh, but it's good to uh, shine the spotlight on rural areas, rural areas as well. Uh, obviously, sometimes poverty and disparities are hidden. So interesting stuff. Moving on, uh, Ben, if you can join, join us. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is Ben McNamee. I'm a senior policy advisor at the National Infrastructure Commission. Um, the Commission provides independent advice on long-term infrastructure challenges to government. Um, so what I'm going to quickly kind of take you through uh, this evening is a recent report that we published in September on uh, how infrastructure can support regeneration in towns. Um, so this is a study that was commissioned, uh, the, government asked, uh, the government commissioned it at the start of last year. They asked us to kind of look at how infrastructure can support levelling up in towns. Uh, specifically how infrastructure can improve economic and quality of life outcomes in towns uh, with a focus on transport and digital infrastructure. 
Um, they gave us six months to do this, uh, which wasn't very long. Um, so um, we uh, couldn't really commission any uh, any new analysis to kind of support this. Um, but I'll kind of take you through kind of some some of our findings. I'm not going to be able to kind of discuss everything, uh, but I'll provide a link to the report in the chat. Um, so first, to kind of what kind of starting with a definition of towns, kind of what sort of places are we talking about? Uh, we kind of took the Office of National Statistics definition. Um, so that's town, that's settlements with a population between 5,000 and 225,000. Uh, and I should have said the scope of the study was England. So moving from, uh, we're moving from Scotland to England. Um, so we just, we were just looking at towns in England between 5,000 and 225,000 population. Uh, that's quite a lot of places. That's more than a thousand places that were in scope of our study. And it includes everything from kind of what are really kind of small, smaller villages to, uh, to kind of places that uh, you would think of as cities like Norwich. Uh, and it also includes towns that are part of kind of mayoral combined authorities, kind of city regions. So places like Stockport and Greater Manchester. Um, so kind of a bit, big kind of variety in the sort of places we were looking at. Uh, the report kind of sets kind of sets the scene. It looks at kind of economic and quality of life outcomes uh, in these towns and kind of all these towns and kind of the performance of transport and digital infrastructure. Uh, and kind of as you'd expect, there is kind of a you know, wide, wide variation. Um, you don't see many trends beyond the obvious ones, kind of things like congestion being more of an issue in, uh, in bigger places, broadband access being worse in rural towns, uh, kind of beyond that, it's kind of hard to kind of draw any conclusions, really. Um, kind of, as I said, we only had six months, so to kind of support the study we did some social research and hosted a series of round tables with the uh, kind of local uh, local leaders around the country um on digital infrastructure i'm not going to say very much um i mean kind of people in towns from our research were generally pretty happy with broadband and mobile coverage um there is a risk that some premises are left behind by kind of broadband rollout uh, particularly particularly be uh, particularly in blocks of flats where there can often be access issues um but, but by and large, kind of people were generally happy with that and didn't see it as a particular priority. So I'm not, I'm going to focus on remarks on kind of transport, um, which was seen as more of a priority for residents in towns, uh, particularly though, um, particularly in terms of roads. Um, that was kind of one of the highest priorities we found in social research, uh, kind of wasn't the highest, there were other issues, kind of better variety of shops, kind of more jobs, they were seen as the highest priorities, but uh, kind of roads is up there. Um, this isn't particularly surprising given the reliance of people on cars uh, for getting around. Uh, kind of UK wide, 61% uh, of journeys in 2019 were taken by car and 77% of journey miles uh, in the UK were um, by car as well. Uh, those aren't town specific, um, we, again, we weren't kind of able to kind of commission any research on this, but the number of cars per household is higher in towns, uh, particularly in rural towns, uh, and people in rural areas drive more miles on average than those in urban towns and cities. Um, so it's kind of fair to conclude that uh, there was kind of a high reliance uh, on cars by people who live in towns, and that was certainly borne out by the uh, kind of source of research that we did. Um, Obviously, that reliance in the longer term is only going to be sustainable with a transition to electric vehicles. Uh, we did kind of look at uh, how the government can support that transition. Uh, in the report, I made uh, some recommendations, but uh, I'm not going to say kind of any more about that. Uh, in terms of public transport challenges in towns, obviously towns are less dense than cities, uh, less able to support the level of public transport provision that's delivered in cities. Um, kind of some particular challenges kind of found that employment sites can lack public transport services. Um, kind of one interviewee from um, some of the research that we did um, said they lived in a town they took if they wanted to take public transport to their job on a business park it was kind of a 10 minute bus journey and then a 40 minute walk to get there. Um, you kind of also see in some places that shift work poses an issues uh, kind of lack of public transport services available in the early morning or late evening to get people from where they live to where they work. Um, so there's kind of a TK Maxx retail distribution centre in Wakefield, which we talk about in the report. Um, 
And then also what one council leader in the Northwest described as employment moats to us. So this is where you've deprived communities within towns that have no public transport access to employment sites, kind of the housing, kind of housing have been put in without the provision of, of those links. Um, so we're kind of a few of the kind of few of the findings there of the kind of role of transport infrastructure. And kind of our conclusion is kind of transport is it's necessary, but not sufficient for generating economic growth and supporting quality of life. Uh, certainly needs to be in place, but on its own, it's not going to do it. Kind of other things you know, like uh, skills, uh, perhaps more important. Um, we kind of found four towns that infrastructure it largely offers opportunities for kind of incremental improvements to economic growth and quality of life. Um, kind of one of the case studies we looked at uh, where this was is hopefully going to be the case is Stevenage. So Stevenage, for those who don't know, it was the first of the new town developments which took place after the Second World War. Um, today, its location and its transport links to London, um, particularly London and also Cambridge, uh, mean that it's become a hub for life sciences and advanced manufacturing industries, which have set up kind of on business parks in Stevenage. Um, but despite that success over the last kind of decade or so um, in attracting these industries, uh, the town centre and the wider town itself hasn't really benefited. Um, kind of the town centre's uh, kind of dead after 5 p.m. There are very few kind of restaurants, uh, nightlife options, and people in the, who work in the business park don't tend to live in Stevenage, and they don't go into the town at town centre at lunchtime either. And kind of one issue the local councillors identified behind this is kind of a substantial lack of investment in the town's infrastructure over many years. The infrastructure dates back to the new town development in the 40s and the 50s. It's kind of all aged at the same time, and it's kind of showing its age at the at the moment. So the council's come up with a 20-year regeneration plan, which is funded by a town deal uh, for the town centre. One of the main parts of this plan is moving the old bus station, which is run down and at the moment acts as a barrier between the town centre and the business parks. Uh, it's the first thing you kind of are presented with if you arrive on Stevenage by the train. Um, to walk from the business parks to the town centre, it's only about 10, 15 minutes, uh, but you have to cross a huge car park. You then have to go through the train station, over a bridge, over a six lane carriageway, then have to uh, cross over some more car parks. And then finally, kind of you have to walk through the bus station to get into the town centre. Uh, it's not a particularly kind of pleasant environment, um, one of the kind of people who work for the council said you leave, if you're coming from London, you leave St Pancras in 2021 and arrive in Stevenage in the 1970s. Um, so one, one of the main kind of parts of the uh, regeneration plan is replacing that bus station with a, with a garden square. And they also want to build a pedestrian boulevard to kind of better link the business parks to the town centre. Um, now that, that on its own is not, it's not going to transform Stevenage by itself, um, but it was kind of seen as a very necessary part of making the town centre more attractive to kind of help bring in uh, new businesses to relocate there and also kind of uh, people to kind of live in the town centre. Um, so that's kind of one example of the role that kind of infrastructure can play in kind of supporting regeneration and kind of our report recommended that every area should have kind of a long term infrastructure strategy for, for its towns. That's developed locally and part of or com complementary to a 15 year place based plan for the economic development of towns, as is in place in Stevenage already. Uh, we found the main barrier to places doing this at the moment is the funding system for local transport. Uh, by our count, uh, this is very difficult to, um, to work out, but we think there are 15 different funding streams at the moment for local authorities to spend on transport projects, and nine of those involve competitive bidding. So I mentioned that Stevenage's regeneration plan is being funded by a town deal. Um, so that's what, that was only possible because Stevenage was successful in, the, uh, in a recent competition for town deals where they had to bid against other places uh, for, the, for the funds. Um, our report kind of sets out some detail kind of why we think the system is flawed, but it kind of in summary, it prevents places effectively planning for the long term because of the uncertainty over exactly what funding they're going to receive, because your funding is, it's dependent on what funding stream is available from the government, 
and more often than not, it's depending on them being successful in winning a share of that funding. Uh, the bidding system itself creates unnecessary costs for local authorities. Uh, everyone has to go to the, uh, through the process of putting a bid together. Um, I've almost finished, sorry, I've been told I'm running out of time. Um, and this is kind of unnecessary, particularly when places, uh, you know, places that lose bids, uh, that kind of that has then been wasted. And whether it really, this really is leveling up, uh, is it the same sort of places that tend to be winning these bids each time? Kind of what about the places that are losing out? They possibly are the ones that need the funds more. Uh, and it also encourages a one size fits all approach. The government determines what funding streams are available uh, based on what they see as a priority, but that may not necessarily fit with what the local priorities are. Uh, if the government sets up a funding stream for potholes, everyone's going to bid for it because there's money available, but potholes might not be what the thing that the place itself most needs money for. Uh, so our recommendation was all county and unitary authorities should have their own devolved five year budgets for infrastructure. Uh, matching the arrangements that are in place for mayor or combined authorities. Uh, and I'll stop there. I'll put a link in to the report in the chat for people to have a look. Thank you, Ben. Uh, moving on, uh, Amanda. Hi there, everyone. Um, I'm Amanda Stone. I'm the real lead in WSP's transport sector. I've had a 30 year career in rail, so it won't surprise you that I'm here to talk about rail tonight. Um, I've developed and delivered rail infrastructure projects um, at Network Rail, um, and I've also worked on the development of uh, policy and strategy for journey time improvements at Transport for the North. And forgive me, because I'm not actually sharing my uh, presentation, but I will do in just a second. It was all set up to go and then something else happened. So, excuse me one second. Apologies, I know I'm eating into very valuable time here. Okay, hey, can you see my screen? We can. Brilliant. Okay, um, so the Northern Powerhouse um, strategy was first published by the government in 2014 and then um, um, actually fully published in 2016 with the primary objective of boosting economic activity across the North and closing the North-South gap. GVA remains lower in the North than in the rest of the country and increasing productivity will benefit not only the North, but the whole of the UK. Um, the strategy focuses on ideas, so investment in research and development and commitment to science and innovation, business through supporting international investment in the region, people through training, education and care to pr improve productivity, and of course infrastructure and specifically rail, which we're here to talk about today. So journey times across the north are often slow, um, service frequency is often poor, and that includes journeys between the major cities of the north, such as Liverpool, Manchester, Sheffield, Newcastle, Leeds and Hull. Uh, you can see the, the average or the, the um, best journey times at present. Average speeds for journeys between the major cities are commonly around 40 to 45 miles per hour um, by rail, and it's not unheard of for average speeds to be around 30 miles an hour. There are enormous benefits to be derived from improving rail connectivity and reducing journey times across the north. Investment in rail infrastructure has the potential to be a social and economic catalyst for the, the region and businesses of the north. The main cities would see substantial benefits from better connectivity. They are major population centres with around half a billion businesses and nearly 15 million people living in or within 90 minutes travel time from them. Investment in infrastructure will help to pr provide access to education, training and employment, unlocking the potential of the, the population and the productivity and economy of the area. So we'll move on to um, the investment that's actually planned for the network in the north. So the recently published integrated rail plan 
um, for the North and Midlands set out the government's plans for investment in rail over the next 30 years. It will see an investment of 96 billion for rail construction and upgrades and highlights of the investment are listed. Um, but of course, not all of the aspirations of the North and Midlands are being taken forward. I'm sure everybody's aware that the proposed Eastern leg of HS2 between Birmingham and Leeds with Spurs to Sheffield and York is now being cut back to East Midlands Parkway. The upgrade of the East Coast Main Line will, however, continue, um, which will um, take account of, of some of the um, requirements of the, um, the Eastern leg, but not all. And a commitment's been made to look at options on how to take HS2 trains to Leeds, although that is, is um, something for um, further into the future. It'll also consider the best way to connect Leeds and Sheffield, and, the and there'll be an allocation of funding to start work on the West Yorkshire mass transit system, improving um, local connectivity around um, Leeds. Um, the aspirations for NPR have also been scaled back. Um, the existing railway between Bradford and Leeds will be upgraded and electrified um, rather than the new line via Bradford, which was proposed by TFN. But this won't deliver the hope for fast services west from Leeds and Bradford to Manchester and beyond. The higher speed connection between Manchester and Sheffield via Markle will also not go ahead now. And development work between Hull and Leeds will focus on electrification and line speed improvements rather than capacity increases. The Manchester to Sheffield route and routes to Hull no longer form part of the core pipeline for NPR. Of course, this is a massive investment in the North and Midlands, and the government's position is that it provides more benefit more quickly and retains the potential for further investment. Northern leaders, on the other hand, are considering whether the integrated rail plan still allows them to achieve the objectives that they have for the North. Thank you. I will now hand over to Nicholas Falk, who will talk about transformative infrastructure. Thank you. Now, why am I not sharing my screen? I've now lost the whole thing. I'm in the difficult position, feeling well like the Prime Minister of not actually seeing my presentation. Ah, oh, there it is. Very good. Um, I'm going to be talking about how to improve local infrastructure. And local connectivity is probably even more critical in tackling levelling up. And I want to talk about why we need to change direction. I'm going to show what we could learn from European cities. I'm going to talk about where the money could come from and particularly about leadership and city leaders. And this is a report we did for the uh, we did for the Greater London Authority on how to assemble land called capital gains and all the case studies there, uh, I really recommend because they show you how to make a transformation. We need to change tack. Uh, as Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England said, we're all in the same storm, but not necessarily in the same boat. And leveling up is above all about equality. And equality is fundamentally affected by access to housing. And over the last 20 or 40 years, uh, whereas demand has increased, the values of houses have gone up, production has remained constant. You'll all have seen, uh, hopefully, this slide. So something has to be done that's pretty radical. And efforts have failed so far, because I would say, first, that developers are short-sighted. They think of the bottom line. The government in, in Britain is excessively over-centralized. Only the Soviet Union has ever tried to run things in the same way. People object to change, they're very conservative with a small c. The land ownership nature of Britain, uh, the fragmented ownership favors speculation. In other words, people focus on how to make money out of the land rather than how to make money out of building housing. And planning, I'm afraid to say, has become largely negative and, and rather depressing. In Copenhagen, is the f so I'm now taking you to Europe which is a much brighter picture. And just in case you think that it's all much rosier there, uh, 30 years ago or so, Copenhagen almost went bankrupt because of industrial decline. Since then, it's been transformed. Uh, and over a third of the trips are by bike. Uh, it sees itself as a cycling capital, where, uh, which is a novel approach. And that's because 
Space that was once taken up by cars has been given in parking has been given over to cyclists. Instead of having a restrictive green belt around Copenhagen, they have this idea of green fingers, in other words, green space between different uh, transport corridors around which development is concentrated. And using land value capture, they managed to fund a whole new town, sorry, a new town funded a whole new metro line. Uh, and this is by, through pooling public land, land owned by the government and, and the city. And I really recommend if you go to Copenhagen, you fly there into the airport, uh, get off at Orestad, which is on the line to the center. I'm going to, you will all have hopefully been to Freiburg or know about Freiburg. And the key to uh, Freiburg is that land values were frozen in land that is unused or used wrongly through urban development measures. In other words, there's a general policy which allows local authorities to recoup the uplift in values and put it into local infrastructure. The sustainable neighbors that you all have heard of, Vauban and Rieselfeld, were built on extensions to tram lines. And there's the tram system. And you can see, and this is clear in the next diagram, that over a 30 year period, the car use went down, public transport went up and cycling went up a lot. So you've ended up in 2010 uh, with a third, a third, a third. And that's the sort of pattern that I'd like to think we could achieve in cities that are comparable like Oxford and, uh, and uh, uh, Cambridge and Bristol and so on. In other words, any university city uh, should be aspiring to be like Freiburg. Now, where should the funds come from? Um, the Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu said, if we don't change direction, we'll end up where we're headed. And alas, we've ended up uh, doing the same thing in house building over 50 years, uh, whereas everything else has changed. So we have to change the way we build and we have to share the uplift in land values. And this is a report, policy report for the TCPA for anyone interested in how to do it. It's all fairly straightforward. And the key is that a substantial part of the cost of building is probably uh, a third in general, but uh, up to or more than a half in big cities like London is used up in land. And the uplift in land values doesn't come from anything that the landowner does typically, but just simply comes from inflation over time and from planning permission. And above all, it's, in, it's dependent on infrastructure. And if you read this wonderful report by Suzuki and Al, it's free download from the World Bank Group financing transit oriented development, development land values, you can find out how successes have done it. And one of the case studies, I'm pleased to say is King's Cross. The potential for land value capture is greatest around London because that's where the land values are highest. And this is a quite useful map which shows how much you could get from each plot uh, from unserviced land. And so we come finally to the question of who should lead. And uh, too many of us, uh, this is a picture of the tanker that was stuck in the Suez Canal. And I think it's rather, it, it's a good picture of what happens in planning generally. We're stuck, it takes a long time to unstuck things. So who's going to take the lead? Well, in the continent, it's mayors who promote smarter urbanization, Montpellier in the south of France being a great example. Uh, and this is diagram is what the previous mayor, uh, Georges Fresh, came up with. It was just a concept to show how to connect Montpellier, a sleepy uh, old university town with the sea. There's now a technopole, one of the, it's the fastest growing city in France, and the whole thing has been achieved through a transit a, tra a tram system. So you see how uh, and this picture of dynamic mayors has been copied in all the French provincial towns and the pace of growth has been very much faster than Paris. But Paris Reef Gauche has also been developing under developed land and this is how they filled over the river, uh, sorry, it filled, <laughs> covered over the railway to build on what they call Paris Reef Gauche. This is the railway line running into the Gare de Lostelitz. And it, it, it shows, if you like, what you achieve if you can get all the authorities to combine forces and you invest up front in infrastructure. It's a fantastic scheme stretching between the peripheric, the inner ring road uh, and the, the French National Library, which is a rather ugly building. Amersfoort in Netherlands is very relevant because Holland is so similar to Britain in, in many respects. Um, but they do things very differently. Land was pulled through a joint venture capital company and backed by a state investment bank. We now have a state investment bank uh, in Leeds. So we should be thinking of doing similar things 
to what was done in Amersfoort. And if you think that this was a, a lefty authority, I can tell you it's a conservative run authority, uh, but the, the Labour alderman who led on several other developments persuaded everyone it was better to collaborate and for land to be pooled than just let, let developers come up with their own ideas and probably do nothing for the community. Probably the best scheme in Europe now is Aspen Seestadt. And this is where an airport has been redeveloped uh, as a really exemplary community on an extension of the metro through uh, to, uh, and um, it does almost everything you might want to see in a community. Uh, but Vienna, like all the examples I've shown, is so much more equal than London, and that's partly, or Britain generally, and that's because a lot of the housing is re is rented, there are a whole series of things, but it, above all, it's because the public sector has taken the lead and in Vienna acquired land. So the airport was, of course, owned by the local authority, and uh, they were therefore able to plow the uplift in values back in the infrastructure. Because I, people are rather sensitive about Europe these days, I thought it was also worth introducing an American example, Portland in Oregon on the West Coast, which has uh, applied many of the same principles. It's exceptional in, in America, but it's still um, uh, very relevant. And it's uh, been a rapidly growing city around the transit system. They use bonds, uh, which are raised against the increase in taxes from development around the railway system, uh, lines, or the, what they call the Metropolitan Air Express. And the floor area ratios are used to fund community benefits. So in other words, they negotiate an uplift in the amount of, of development allowed, and then they use that to fund uh, benefits for the community in a predictable way, unlike the rather uncertain approach that we take through section 106. So I think I've just about come to the end of my time. Nobody could ever have taken a trip around Europe faster than I've done. And I'm just going to recommend the report and the videos that have, on which the report is based of an event that uh, we organized with the Academy of Urbanism on rapid transit and urban recovery. BB, just focus. got your message. Yep. I am, but it should be finished about 5.10. So, the, so um, I'll leave you with that. Do take a look at it and uh, go to the, and you can see just how they did it in Copenhagen, Aarhus, Dublin and Nottingham. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, yeah, I think th this whole event is very much an introduction to levelling up. Uh, it's, it, as I said, it's very, been a very ambitious programme. Obviously, you know, we've we've reached seven o'clock already, uh, but I think it was important that we had uh, the number of people that we have had on this call uh, to uh, touch upon a, a variety of different aspects to levelling up. And I, I'm hoping that this is just the start. So in terms of one question is how should we take this forward, uh, Nicholas, in terms of the academy, but more broadly, as practitioners, we operate within a, a political framework, uh, but it'd be good to get your views on how we should, uh, as practitioners, as uh, interested in uh, good places, how can we, yeah, take take this event okay. forward going forward <laughs> well I, I could talk for an hour about that but um uh, i think we place far too much emphasis on what national government does and laws and standards and so on um which we, we think when we've set a target it will mean uh, something be achieved whereas in fact change takes from, place from the bottom up and if we want to really make a difference let's focus on places where there's good potential for change because there is real demand for new housing uh, that's the first point. Uh, secondly, uh, let's see, we, we need to change the way we value land and so on, and, and, and a lot of people are pressing to get changes, and I think with Michael Gove in position, there's a real chance, but we have to have the examples set up, so I think it's very important for local authorities to sometimes just think creatively about where, how they could make the best use of their existing transport system, including underused lines and freight lines in oxford i've been making the case uh, which is great well coming off now a long whilst for what we call the spine line and reopening the line to cowley for uh, passenger trains but the key then and this is the third point is to join the transport and the development together uh, it's ridiculous that these are seen so separately in funding and planning terms so i, I think you've got to put people in the same room if they can't be in the same room but <laughs> 
firmly, <laughs> let's at least have meetings between them on, on a regular basis. Uh, I think that I would finally say that we've got to focus on how to create new funding streams for local authorities. This absurd lottery that uh, Ben talked about of bidding against each other and so on for pots of money is, is, is a stupid way of doing things that no other country would allow because it's not democratic. So what we've got to do is to once again create fund the ability for local authorities to raise funds from their area, probably from the sub-region, perhaps from the county or the city regions. So changes are needed not only in the way we capture uh, value uh, in the uplift on new development, and I've written extensively about this, but also reforming the rating system. There is, there is talk about doing this, it's quite unfair and uh, at the moment, and we have to accept that some people, probably the top 10% or 20% in terms of housing value, have to pay more if necessary taken uh, when they die from the value of their estate. So those four things are related. Uh, and uh, in my view, young urbanists should be pressing because you're going to live into the future and you may even have children. And the future is bleak in this country and it's been bleak for 20 or 40 years. It's not a new thing. And, and therefore it's time we woke up to how we're lagging far behind the rest of Europe. And uh, if we can't join the U European Union, let's, let's at least learn from how they make things work in situations that are comparable to our own. That's a good summary. Uh, I'll open it up to others. I've, I've noticed that there's no questions in the chat. Whilst maybe others can give some thought to any questions, uh, I have got one for Ben. Uh, you touched briefly on uh, EV uh, as a form of that could be focused upon, but what, what role does net zero play? Uh, I noticed we didn't have time to uh, you didn't have time to discuss Grimsby, uh, but obviously there's a lot of offshore wind around that area. And I think the whole thing about levelling up is playing to an area's strength. Uh, and obviously there are coastal areas where offshore wind and uh, net zero industries are uh, going to grow and be a, quite a good opportunity to improve productivity. It'd be good to get your views, especially in the case study of Grimsby, but unfortunately I don't think you had time to discuss. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, so we, Grimsby, as you said, it's kind of the, the kind of local economy in that <clears throat> Grimsby and the surrounding towns has kind of changed from kind of what was kind of, you know, fishing um, kind of much more now kind of offshore, uh, offshore wind uh, and kind of associated industries have kind of sprung up around there. Um, you know, one important role that <clears throat> infrastructure can play there is making sure that those those employment sites, those industries are kind of have good transport links to kind of to the town, to the town centres. So Im Immingham was uh, one place in particular where kind of a, a road has been put in between Immingham and uh, and where some of the offshore wind industry uh, industries have located. Um, again, just, yeah, making sure that we kind of we are with linking up places. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice a little bit. That's fine. Uh, definitely linking up places was key. Uh, Carlos, in, in terms of uh, opportunities in rural areas, where do you see the main opportunities uh, for active transportation anywhere within the UK? Well, that's a tricky question. Uh, but sorry. I think there are plenty, <laughs> there are plenty of um, challenges, as I said before, but I would say that if you look at the stats, um, at least in Scotland, it is common to find that in many of these rural areas, like in Scottish borders or in Fries and Galloway, many of these uh, of the trips that are done by car, I think in the figure is 60% or something like that. They are for less than five miles. And these recognize uh, an opportunity because then it means that if we are aiming towards this goal, there is a national goal, goal of reducing 20% of on road transportation. I don't remember the year for the target, but that is the target. And probably that 60% of trips that is currently being done by car um, and, and, and for 
less than five miles is the the one that we need to focus on. Um, so there's a lot of behavioral change involved in this, of course, because it's not easy to um, to make people change their privacy and 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 the the, the it's always more convenient for them um, to go by car because when you are in rural environments, you are usually um, surrounded by more trunk roads or the kind of transportation that is uh, circulating in these areas is sometimes is like there's there's a lot of heavy transportation of goods and timber transportation and stuff like that and that makes active travel um, um, yeah, put it in put active travel in a very complicated situation in terms of road safety. But, but yes, I think there are these uh, opportunities regarding this figure of, of the trip that are currently being done by car and could be, there could be a model shift there. And what would you, what are your views on uh, the planning system uh, making active travel more of a requirement uh, from a sort of statutory perspective? Is there an opportunity as part of the planning white paper that uh, active travel does become uh, considered more often in a, in a requirement for developers and applicants having to demonstrate how they're integrating uh, active travel into the design of their schemes? Yes, absolutely. I, and I think Scotland has been taking like a step forward in terms of the NPF4, because if, if you look at the draft of the policy, they are now including at active travel as a transversal area, and they are thinking on reducing planning applications for active travel projects so that it can be, you know, like prioritized. And, and even though in Scotland, there is not a design code that puts more um, detail into how integrate active travel and new developments. I think that is something that the NPF4 is also going to, to, to provide like a platform to to develop more guidelines so that the planning applications can actually integrate more requirements to, to, to the new developments regarding active travel. So I think, yeah, the, from the policy point of view, those changes are happening now in, in, in Scotland. It could be a reference probably for areas like Wales that also have like geographic settings that are more similar and even some parts of England, like in the, yeah, in the north and, and... Yeah, geography is key. Uh, Kevin, you want to wrap today? We're going to wrap yeah, up. Yeah, no, if we can. Uh, it, just a massive thanks to everyone. Uh, obviously, we've been trying to organise this event since April, uh, start of the year, uh, and getting everyone on board, uh, getting everyone such a wide variety of speakers and having their own views and opinions has been really good and I'm just hoping that this is just the start uh, obviously we've gone over the, the the allocation that we've that we've been given uh, but as I said uh, there's a lot of discussion that can be had on this and it'd be great if the academy can take it forward mm. uh, so yeah no thanks a lot and I've, I've